Hey, Tracy. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the August 3rd Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are probably all aware, uh, two things that we have to abide by on the call. The first is the antitrust policy uh, that is displayed on the screen. Um, so basically there's competitors on this call. Let's not uh, do anything that is prohibited under any of the antitrust and competition laws. The second one, our code of conduct, which is late in the agenda. And of course, all are welcome to join this call and participate. For announcements today, we have the standard Hyperledger Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you do have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please do leave a comment for consideration on the link uh, that is in the agenda. The uh, next three uh, items, I think I'm going to hand off to Sean to yep. talk to. Thanks, Tracy. I'll keep this really quick. Um, the Q3 editorial campaign is Hyperledger Identity. Um, if you have news, announcements, something you want to promote that's related to Hyperledger Identity projects, please let us know. Uh, you can send an email to PR at hyperledger.org about that. Um, and we'd love, you know, it, including things like developer showcase recommendations, et cetera. We'd love to to get some more inbound. Um, Animo, who are the, the the team members at Animo are really great maintainers and, and contributors to Aries and Aries Framework JavaScript. Um, they've just announced making Aries Framework JavaScript a global framework. It's a call for sponsors and partners to make it easier to build EU suitable applications with Aries Framework JavaScript. There's a link there. Um, and Lisi, uh, who are using Indie, Aries, and Anoncreds, uh, recently announced a new messaging feature for their agent and wallet, and you can find out more there. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Thanks, Sean. Any other announcements that anybody would like to make? Okay. So, no. Uh, for quarterly reports, uh, when I put this agenda together, we had the Sawtooth report that had come in. Um, and obviously, the Q2 Sawtooth report is still out there with some questions and requests for changes. But I do have a look at the, the latest Sawtooth report. Uh, we also, since then, have gotten the Anonpres, Aries, Indy, and the Aloha uh, reports that have come in. So please do take a look at those. Any questions about the project reports? Okay. Uh, so then for our discussion today, we have the uh, security policy uh, PR that Arun has put out there um, that we should discuss and determine whether or not we want to approve this and get it merged in. Hey, Arun, would you prefer to drive? Sure, Sean. Um, you could continue sharing the screen. So okay. the, the GitHub PR that you all, all see here um, is translation of the Google Doc that um, I believe all of you have already reviewed. And we are now formulating this proposal and then bringing it uh, to each of the project. And as discussed earlier, um, the uh, people infrastructure part would affect all the projects that are incubated and we require all projects to take action uh, based on once we get this proposal through so um have uh, like before we continue has anybody reviewed the document uh, is, is anybody able to review the document either on Google Docs or on the GitHub? I know Tracy gave a few comments related to linking the sections. Um, I did most of them. I'll update the PR in some time. But is anybody able to review uh, the document itself? Yes, Peter. I did. To me, everything seemed great in it. I didn't have uh, much. Uh, to comment or change requests on it. Thanks, Peter. Hi, Dave. Hi, I looked at it. Um, my initial 
question when I looked at it was like, the, I think the most important thing in this is explaining how people can open a security vulnerability. And I thought that was a little bit confusing in this. It talked about using the security email up closer to the top and then closer to the bottom, it talked about using the GitHub um, security advisories. And there wasn't much discussion about when to use which one. So I thought that part could be clarified. Understood. Right, so um, I can comment on, on um, what I understood by your question and maybe uh, we can discuss on that aspect. So the, so there are, there are, um, okay, so the, the GitHub sec security advisory section that you see um, later in the document that talks about how do we notify uh, to the public of something that has been uh, fixed and something that was reported, uh, like a, a standard process that we should follow across uh, within the foundation, right? And I believe there was also an open question on the Google Doc, if I'm not wrong, where um, if existing projects, uh, existing big projects have a process defined for issuing advisories and like that should be considered in. I think that goes back to um, you there probably from within the fabric community or or maybe the big projects that we have within Hyperledger, trying to understand if you have a process existing for uh, issuing advisories, if not, then we would go with GitHub security advisory as a recommendation. And uh, the reporting is uh, in the initial stages, the advisory is on the later stages. And if that is confusing, maybe we can add uh, a paragraph or maybe a clarifying uh, sentences in, in the document. If you, if you know the exact lines, we can read through it now. Otherwise, um, I have noted down the feedback. I'll go back and uh, read through it, that part and add clarifications. Okay, yeah, I think if you just follow like the GitHub docs, they'll point you towards the GitHub advisor even for the reporting stage. And I think any community member can in fact go to the security tab of a project and report a vulnerability there. So I think that's where people might get confused. Understood. Good point, uh, noted down. I'll go back and uh, check that section. And you, you asked about Fabric itself. So we have been using the Hacker One, but I'm fine um, switching off of that and going to either the email or the um, GitHub security vulnerability reporting. I think those are, maybe we support both uh, going forward. I think those are both good options. Thanks, Dave. Any other comments or thoughts? So um, I think if, if there are no more questions on this, then this will impact all the incubated projects that they will have to go and update their security policies to reflect the uh, template, which is over here. And um, the highlighted part in the document would need to be updated by requirements of each project based on what process or the uh, tooling options they have within the project. However, the general infrastructure of how we hand, deal with uh, a, a security issue from the reporting stage till the um, fix uh, and then uh, the uh, release phase, the document serves as a general recommendation for all the projects. So as a follow-up to this, the, the we would like to propose uh, next task force as part of uh, within the security domain. This is for signing off release binaries and and uh, the general approach to be followed over there.
And Arun, that's the one that's already uh, in our issues uh, as a non-started task force, is that correct? That's the that's uh, artifact, artifact signing task force? That's, that's correct, Tracy. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely add that to the um, the round robin of task force discussions that we have. That's a good feedback. Um, any other part that needs to be discussed? Yes, Peter. Just a quick question about the embargo list. So it, it is essentially up to the maintainers to decide if the, the project is too small or big enough to have an embargo list, or is it mandated uh, by the policy to have an embargo list? Question. Um, I think the recommendation document, if I'm correct, the wording that we have right now suggests that maintainers can choose to say a particular project is small enough and then uh, follow that statement with the arguments like why does project maintainers think that particular project is small and need to have an embargo list um, any comments from the team here yeah so um Sean, if you wouldn't mind going to files changed and bringing up the section, uh, if you scroll down to where it says embargo list, um, I think what it says at the very top, once we get there, is that um, going, there's a whole, yeah, the whole section that says embargo. Uh, I think it says that graduated projects are recommended to have, yeah, here, right here. Uh, so the Hyperlater Foundation recommends that graduated pro projects maintain an embargo list. So that's a recommendation, like a should, not a must, if I read that correctly. Okay, I, oh, sorry. I was going to ask Rama, what does he think about that for cacti, but he's not on the call. Okay, I will just have to discuss that for cacti at the cacti maintainers meeting. It's highly recommended that at least the reason for why a project thinks embargo list is not needed should be captured um, so that people are aware. Maybe I think it's at the later. Can you scroll down a bit? Um, yeah, oh, 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 sorry, it's it's over there. The If the project does not maintain an embargo list, and, um, yeah, so this this part of the document would need to be edited by the project. The, the project does not maintain an embargo list. This is because of one of the reasons uh, that you would mention. It may change because of if in future something else happens. Could we just say an embargo list is necessary? It just can be empty. Um, so I don't know how to read that statement. Can you elaborate? Like if, if you say it is necessary, um, so you're saying that the project has importance and then if you're saying that it can be empty, you're saying that you don't know who the users, consumers of the particular projects are. Is that what you're it saying? It means nobody is asked to be on the embargo list. Surely to get on the embargo list, you have to ask to be put on the embargo list, I believe, right? Isn't there some sort of process that says, you know, if you want to be on the list, and then you get voted on? So wouldn't it make sense that it everyone just have one and it's empty and it begins empty and then people are at it? Well, 
I mean, I think I think that makes sense, Stephen. I think there's, um, you know, what you're saying is basically uh, we have an embargo list. Everybody has an embargo list. It starts empty, um, and then when people request to get on the embargo list, the the security team of that project gets to choose whether or not said request gets accepted or not. If it gets accepted, then now you've got a non-empty embargo list. If it doesn't get accepted, you still have an empty embargo list. And I think what that means that is if the project is too small, right, where they, they don't have um, the capability to, to kind of handle the embargo list, then basically every request gets rejected. But I think it, it makes sense for there to be that request process coming in to, to start um, to see whether or not, you know, does it now make sense because somebody's actually using this in a large scale um, way, right? And I think the other thing this does is it helps us to understand who the adopters truly are uh, of the project because I would assume that part of the request for getting added to the embargo list is, I wanna get added to the embargo list because I'm using this for you know, whatever use case it is that they're using it for. Right. So I think the current proposal does not state how an entry request should be filed. Uh, if an entity, like what process do an organization need to follow? Um, we could structure that as a separate document in a separate uh, place. If somebody is interested in to be part of embargo list, then this is the process that we generally advise for you to follow up. However, each project, we could also give an option for each project team to define their own process because the decision um, would be with the maintainers of the project. It's a good point. And about the compulsory embargo list and then leaving it empty. I need to go back and check if that's a recommended approach. I haven't heard of a process like that. Good feedback, Stephen. Yes, Peter. I just had this idea that we could add a single small paragraph or sentence that would remind people to be careful about accidentally disclosing who is on the embargo list by discussing it on a recorded maintainer's call. Because it's easy to just make that mistake. Uh, you know, you dial into the maintainer's call, it's automatically recorded. And then it just gets uh, swept up as the information gets Thanks published. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. I, um, I want to ask opinion to this group over here. So the, the general idea behind the embargo list is that the detail shared to the embargo list uh, related to project is of confidential nature uh, because it can it can pose potential threats if if a particular vulnerability is severe and then it has potential of being exploited and there is also a risk where if there are competing organizations which are part of embargo list and they are aware of the vulnerability then that's another risk that we pose. So that's why um, it's important for for us to know, make sure like the participants of embargo list 
are aware of uh, all these consequences and then they they know uh, like they have their own responsibilities to be followed however um it's the the list itself i don't know if it needs to be kept confidential So Arun, at line 213 there, it does say, you know, that the, um, I think it was 213, um, basically the list itself is private in order to make sure that uh, you're not going to have attackers basically being able to, to go against those particular organizations that are using the, the project. So. Um, I think that is important, right? That that our embargo list does remain private within the security team. Okay, makes sense. I guess this was added later part of feedback from the OpenSSF team's recommendation. Um, in such a case, I think I agree. We can add a paragraph to the maintainers telling them importance of keeping these discussions outside of their maintain regular calls. Thanks for the suggestions, Peter. Thanks for noting that, um, Tracy. Any other comments that anybody has? Arun, anything else from your end? Um, no, Tracy, I'm good. So okay. I think the opens that I noted down so far are the um, clarification on security advisory and then reporting an incident, and then read through the GitHub security advisory page and make sure there are no ambiguities between this document that we have with the link that we have pasted. The other suggestion was on the um, embargo list itself, add the clarification that project teams would need to have an intake process and if possible then uh, come up with the process at the foundation level a general recommendation and then project teams can adopt or decide to put additional checks the final suggestion is on the um, discussions like adding a clarification statements to keep the embargo list membership information being disclosed in public courts Thanks for all the feedback. Tracy, back to you. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll wait then to uh, vote on this until we get those updates in place. And um, that was actually the end of the agenda for today, unless anybody has anything they'd like to bring up to discuss with this audience. Marcus? Um, yeah, so I I checked um, yesterday, I guess, or I found it on the internet that in September there is this open source summit, this Linux Foundation uh, conference is actually happening. And then I was wondering what about um, the hyperletric group forum for this year? I guess it's a little bit too late uh, to have something like that. 
by this year. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about that and maybe I could ask, uh, ask this here in, in our setup to the Hyperledger folks or Tracy, if you know anything about that, if there are any plans. Yep, for sure. Uh, so my understanding is that um, there's going to be a member summit that is going to happen this year. Uh, there's actually one in, uh, I think, North America, and then there's one in uh, Asia Pacific area. Um, so if you're a member company and uh, interested in attending that, um, you should have received some information about that already. Um, and then for the uh, Hyperledger Global Forum, the intent is to have it uh, in 2024. Uh, so the, my understanding is at least the last time they were uh, looking for the right venue for that uh, for that conference. And um, I know they were supposed to be having some calls like the last time I heard. So they, they may already have some information on that that I'm not aware of. But uh, yeah, that's that's the status of that. Right. I mean, did did you guys hear from uh, from I don't know general community members on Discord that there is uh, I mean high demand on such a gathering where the community can come together and develop, um, discuss whatever the current development things like that. So that that we maybe as a TOC uh, should also try to. Uh, to stress a little bit on on such an event, or maybe not. Uh, an event such as the Global Forum, or are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, such a Global event? Forum. Okay. Or, okay. I mean, in the past, we also had, had uh, those hackathons. Exactly, exactly. That's why I was asking, um, were you were you looking more for, we also had like a maintainer summit, I think in Minnesota uh, one year. Um, so, you know, I didn't know if we were talking about maybe potentially also uh, looking at something like that, where we're bringing together the maintainers of the project. So, in kind of that hack fest setting, that unconference setting versus the global forum. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, from my personal experience, is whatever uh, come together is actually beneficial to, for any form of collaboration. And if this is in form of the hyperledger global forum or a hack fest or a maintainer summit, doesn't really matter so much. Uh, but I was wondering if. The community actually asked for something like that. If 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 you heard something about that, I mean, I I got uh, those questions uh, from our internal teams, um, but I haven't really seen questions on Discord yet. But I'm also not. I mean, there are so many channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't seen any specific uh, questions in Discord uh, related to bringing together kind of the the developer community either in a hack fest or in the Google forum. Um, like I said, I, I do know that there were some conversations about uh, global forum uh, in the governing board meeting that have been discussed, um, but mm -hmm. the date has not yet been set for that. But it it is, uh, you're right, it's not going to be 2023, it's going to be 2024. Yeah, all right. Okay, yeah, thanks Tracy for sharing this with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else that anybody would like to discuss or bring up today? I have what I think is a staff issue in the chat. Yeah, apologies, my um, mouse has fallen on the floor um, and I think it's disconnected everything. So I'm not able to read the chat. Uh, Sean, is there anything there that uh, yeah, staff's aware of it. Um, I'm the only member of staff on the call today, so I'm going to follow up with David and uh, the team. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, anything else that anybody would like to bring up before we close today? All right, so if not, uh, I believe that Rama is back next week and uh, we did talk about doing the project cycle badging task force next week. So um, I'll definitely reach out to Raman early next week to make sure that he's uh, ready for that. And hopefully that's what we'll be talking about next week. And if we're ready for the vote on the security policy 
um, we'll add that to the agenda as well. Anything else that anybody would like to discuss before we close? All right, so if not, we will see you next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you, bye guys.